everybody. This is Ryan McClanahan with HistoryThroughCards.com. I hope you're all doing very well today. I have another national story to tell you guys. You know, the national was great. I, I absolutely loved it. I saw a lot of great cards, some very rare cards, and uh, probably more importantly, I met a lot of awesome people, some for the first time, uh, like Dustin, the sports card dad. And so... I'm walking around, milling around, kind of minding my own business, and I see in the corner of my eye that a dealer has a bunch of 1916 M101 cards, and I am a sucker for this set. Uh, you know, it's black and white, and I know a lot of people are saying, oh, it's black and white, who cares? But uh, for me, I, I love it because the player selection and for a lot of people who collect the M101 series, it's not really the players per se, uh, but what's on the back. And I am a sucker for the advertising in this series. And because, again, I'm a historian and I, I love to do research on the stuff, not just the ball players, but the, um, the advertising and the companies themselves and who uh, started the companies. And so, I asked the dealer if I could see these cards. And he had a stack, maybe about five or six cards. And I was really shocked to see what was on the back. It ended up being this right here. And this is a Holmes to Holmes, which was a, a bread company, a baking company from Washington, D.C. Now, I've done a lot of research on this set, and uh, I'm not quite prepared to uh, release the article just yet. I want to make sure that... I cross my T's and dot my I's first before I send out the article. But um, this is a fantastic set. It's a great back. The problem is that each and every one of these cards is damaged. And there's only 80 known cards out of the 200 that should be in the set. Uh, it is that rare. And so I think... Uh, there's probably one or two cards uh, per player, uh, if that. And uh, there was a find uh, back in 2019 that uh, they have actually located a Babe Ruth. And so there's only one, but they also have a, a Ty Cobb and a Napoleon Lajouet and I think a Hornets Wagner they found as well. Um, this set is kind of notorious to... Uh, all around the M101s, especially the uh, the Babe Ruth and, and the uh, Hornets Wagner for being reprints. So you have to be really, be very careful uh, about um, purchasing these, thinking that they're original, uh, especially the, the homes uh, to homes, because as I said, there's really only 80 of these known. And the first two finds, I believe one was found, a grouping was found in 1987, and then the other one in 1991. Um, and they were both found in uh, a, a book. Uh, and they were all taken out of that book, but they were all ripped uh, to shreds. And that's why you have uh, back damage. So I have a question for you guys about this. Um, as I always say, uh, grab the card when you can, if it's very rare. And you, you might be able to upgrade later on. But... Um, in this instance, you're not going to be able to upgrade the card because they're all damaged. Now, knowing that, would you still purchase the card? And, you know, again, the amount of money that you would pay is, you know, up to you. Uh, I didn't pay a whole lot for this card that I remember, uh, but I, I do have maybe two copies. And uh, this one actually happens to be Fred Snodgrass, who's a very famous ball player. In any event, um, I knew that the uh, the cards there, they're all in really horrible condition. And the uh, dealer had price tags between 125 and 375 And I I may have messed up. I, I probably should have I grabbed the one that was $125. But... It was uh, just the paper loss was just so bad, and there was a gouge in the card, and saw a lot of gouging in, in these cards. This card actually happens to have a um, 
a crease in it as well. But uh, again, like I say, there's um, maybe two incidences where you would want to buy a card for your collection that is in like good to very good condition or even authentic. Uh, and, and one of them is that if it's normally a card of say a ball player that you might not be able to afford otherwise, say like Mickey Mantle or Ted Williams or um, even Babe Ruth, and, and and the card is just in, in trash condition. Uh, again, uh, you know, you can leave your comments down below, but you know, would you purchase a card in in really bad condition, say poor, poor condition? Um, and the other reason too is is because of extreme rarity, and and so, um, you know, a lot of times like your Mickey Mantle cards are not that rare. Uh, Mickey Mantle does have a uh, a dog food card from 1951, which uh, is I think it's superior dog food. Um, but it's from 1951 and it's his rookie and I think there's maybe just a handful of copies known to exist. Um, however, uh, the majority of your Mickey Mantle cards are uh, not difficult to find. They're just very expensive. Uh, this, this example right here, these copies are, are really expensive. I, I take that back. They're not, they're not as expensive as they should be. Um, to, because of the rarity, but they are extremely rare because of now there's only 80 copies known and some are like one or two copies per player. Um, they did find in, in 2019, they found uh, a, a, a Babe Ruth card, they found Napoleon Lajue, and they found, um, I, I wanna say, uh, Honus Wagner as well. And I think those are all uh, single copies. Um, I, I really kind of, uh, not sure if I would ever pick up a Babe Ruth or a Hornus Wagner from this set because a lot of those cards are actually um, reprinted uh, or forged. And so uh, a lot of times uh, collectors and people who are very familiar with the M101 series, um, they're, they're really in it for the, the backs of the cards. And some of the backs are really kind of only known through a few examples. The, um, the green joist, for example, I have one right here. Yeah, should turn that around for you. The green joist, I have a few of these too, and um, those those are extremely rare too. Uh, there was a find a few years ago, and so uh, there's probably maybe two or three hundred copies out there. Um, but but again, like there's only eighty of these. So when I look at the back of this particular card, I ask myself the question. How come we only see 80 cards? How come there's not a complete set to go on? We don't know all the cards, obviously, that are in this particular set. We should, but what happened to the company? Why um, is, is there only 80 cards? And the fact that uh, we have maybe three finds uh, is really kind of astounding, too. It makes me think, too, that what else is out there that we don't know about and there are uh, sports card issues uh, that have really only been recently been found um and you know the 1910 derby chocolates is a, a great example because we only have 47 of those cards in existence and there are only two finds and um we don't know what else is out there uh it also makes me think too that um the guys who really uh, were collecting these cards back in 1916, they would become uh, the hobby founders in, in the 1930s and 40s and 50s. And uh, that generation, uh, the 1918 generation and the uh, greatest generation, those guys, they, um, they tried to pass down a lot of the information uh, to other generations, but it, it wasn't always successful uh, because that information is, is now kind of lost. Uh, it, it's really kind of being pieced together by guys like me and, and others uh, for, for future generations. But this is only as good as uh, the information that's actually out there. And it took a lot of time and energy and effort for Jefferson Burdick and John D. Wagner and Lionel Carter to 
actually dig through and sift through the uh, the data, the information. Uh, and, and it's not like they had an internet to go by. You, even stuff on the internet is uh, obviously sometimes it's not reliable or it just it, it's missing. And so we have a lot of like missing details about the cards, the sets, the owners especially. I don't think there's a whole lot that goes into um, investigating the owners and the companies themselves. Um, and, and that's because, again, a lot of information is missing out there. And uh, a lot of people kind of just focus solely on the cards today and what they're worth. And, you know, I, I have no real problem per se with uh, what a card is worth, but there's a lot of people out there who just kind of focus on how much a card is worth and what you can buy for it or, or sell it for. And there's not enough people out there who are actually willing to take the time and energy to actually uh, find out more about the manufacturer of the card or how it was issued or who issued it uh, or the owners. Um, and so uh, a, a lot of times um, I, I have found that there are cards that are, are still being, um, I guess, processed, if you will, or, or um, new to the hobby that maybe have been issued uh, 150 years ago. And it, it makes me kind of think, too, that uh, everything that we have today, uh, all the, the modern cards that we have today, um, at some point, as Dustin, the uh, personal sports card dad or the sports card dad, I always get that confused. Anyway, um, every he says that every card today, every modern card will eventually become a vintage, and he's absolutely correct. Um, at some point, this card was modern, and you know, for for the guys who were collecting it back in 1916, which would have been John D. Wagner and and um, I mean not, well, Lionel Carter was was not even uh, alive when this card was issued. And in fact, I don't think that he actually knew about this uh, particular card until maybe when he was an elderly man, because they first were found in the 1980s. Um, they certainly weren't around uh, when Jefferson Burdick was. He didn't know anything about this set. And so um, at some point, I think what's going to happen is that you're going to have two or three generations go by. Uh, where they they might not know about a a set that we all know about today, which is perfectly common, um, and and it took a lot of time and effort and energy for those guys, uh, original hobby founders, to actually put together uh, sets and uh, checklists, and that was huge for them. These guys, they may have grown up with uh, the T two O six. Uh, or the 1916 M101 set, but that doesn't mean that they knew everything about the cards because you have to remember, you know, Jefferson Burdick was only you know, 11, 12, 16 years old when those sets were issued, and he didn't start collecting uh, again until, I'd say, 1933. And uh, you know, John D. Wagner, I don't think he actually ever stopped collecting, but... Um, they didn't know all, all the cards that, that were on a particular set because there were no checklists. Today, we kind of take that for granted. And um, you have to have people who are willing to uh, not only just, you know, issue the checklists or find them out, but to pass them down to other generations. And in a lot of cases, our hobby pioneers, for as much as I revere these guys and love them dearly, uh, they didn't always um, pass down their information. And a lot of times their information that they worked so hard to uh, gather uh, is um, missing. And a lot of the hobby publications are, are not in your average everyday collector's hands. Um, it, it takes a lot of time and, and energy again for uh, those people who actually have uh, your card collector's bulletin and, and other resources to digitally um, scan all that data. And, and that can take a long time. And, you know, I remember uh, when, say, the Boston Public Library uh, tried to uh, digitize all their, their material 
it took a very long time, years in fact, and in a lot of cases, uh, just for your average everyday newspaper. Uh, today, your, your newspapers are uh, digital anyway, but there's a, a, just a huge chunk of the stuff that is not digitized even today. So you're getting bits and pieces of information, not the everyday record. And, and um, the newspapers themselves, I, I want to say uh, it's taken about maybe 10 to 15 years to digitize maybe 30% of all newspapers. And so we still have a long way to go. So if you can imagine uh, somebody in the hobby actually digitizing all of our, um, our, our archival information, it, it's almost... I'm not going to say it's impossible, but it's close to it. It's it really takes someone with, with a lot of dedication and, and, and work, and, and I'm not sure who else is out there who, who would actually be willing to do that. Um, I, I would love to see uh, a year by year accounting of a lot of the um, the hobby record, though that that's really kind of difficult too. The other thing too is that. Uh, our hobby founders, for as much as I love these guys, they didn't know um, as much, I think, as we do today. And that's not to put these guys down. Uh, it really isn't. The, the problem is is that, you know, again, there's not a, um, a, a one source. Uh, these guys had to just sift through uh, just countless uh, books uh, to come up with a, a lot of the stuff that they already published, um, you know, especially when it comes to like say maybe D Long Gum Company. And even then, you know, when I was finding out stuff about the D Long Gum Company, uh, it, you know, it was stuff that hadn't been seen in probably 90 years, uh, if not more. And and so uh, it takes a, a certain special eye to figure out what is what, what is important, what is key. And, um, you know, it, it takes some time to do that. And, and uh, not everybody wants to do that. So uh, the, oh, the other thing, too, um, when, when those guys were uh, collecting back in the 1930s, uh, say, like Gaudi, which is a perfect example, that company went out of business in November of 1962, and they still didn't know what the hell was. Uh, it was they, they didn't know really anything about that company until maybe about 1969 when um, there was a, a professor John Fawcett who uh, just happened to have asked the last owner of the Gaudi gum company for their documents and you have a lot of um, information that's in say uh, books like this the uh, auction catalogs um, which really kind of muddled the waters too. Uh, a lot of the information in, in these books were um, nice in the past. Maybe it's a little bit different now. Uh, it was only to sell and gin up sales, which I'm not going to blame them at all. But um, you don't know what is accurate uh, when it comes to stuff like this. And so you have to double check your sources. And uh, in the case of Gaudi, um, we, we only have uh, that information because of uh, certain, um, a, a certain set of uh, circumstances that allowed for the, uh, the, origin, the last owner to give John Fawcett um, all of his paperwork. But he also said, too, that a lot of his paperwork, uh, this was uh, Thompson now, uh, the, the last president, he said that he... Uh, threw out a lot of the uh, information on Gaudi, uh, supposedly, as, as lore, hobby lore goes, was that um, he had he had burned a lot of that documentation uh, to heat the building. I don't think that's true. I really don't. I've written now maybe two articles on the 33 and 34 Gaudi set, and I got another two left. Um, I think it's just good hobby lore. But you have to be very careful about hobby lore and, and really kind of back it up with actual facts. And, you know, in, in uh, certain cases, uh, I had a very hard time just finding out uh, who the last president is. 
and the succession of presidents of the Gowdy Gum Company, uh, starting with uh, Enos Gordon Gowdy, which uh, his photo and his uh, documentation is very easy to find. But then after that, when he resigns or he retires uh, from that company, it, it gets a little sketchy from there. And there's a lot of uh, black holes and mysteries surrounding it. And that's what I'm talking about, e even with this set right here. I, I know who the owner is. I found a photo of him and a lot of his uh, documentation. And uh, I will be writing, you know, again, I, I do have an article on this set. I, I haven't published it yet uh, because I'm not sure uh, whether or not, I, in which direction I want to go into, uh, whether or not I want to uh, publish the entire uh 16 um, advertisers or one individually here and there. I'm not entirely sure. So uh, I, I am for right now keeping that information to myself. I, I do want it out there for all of you so you guys know. Um, and and the, the thing that I also want you guys to know too is that uh, just because I am doing this stuff, uh, I, I also want you guys to learn as much as possible as well. Not just about modern stuff, but also with uh, vintage as well. And so I don't really, per se, collect modern stuff, but I still want to learn about it. Uh, even though the, like, I may not collect it, I want to be well-rounded and, and well-educated. Um, and you should be well-educated on, on a lot of stuff and kind of well-rounded, even if you're not in the field, if you're not collecting or, you know, you never know when you're going to need that information. Um, and, and for me, I, I do a lot of like research. I, I, I listen to a lot of other uh, collectors and dealers and what they have to say. And, and for me, because I don't really know a whole lot about modern stuff, uh, there are collectors out there that do know about this stuff. Uh, I, you know, uh, Dustin, the sports card dad, or Dakota um, from Sports Cards Anonymous. And, you know, these guys also know a lot about, say, you know, football or whatever, modern cards um, that that uh, I, I just kind of find very interesting. Although I don't collect this stuff, um, you should always um, learn something new every day. What I find is really interesting is, is that um, you have a lot of people who are picking up where our hobby founders left off. And, and so there are card sets out there that our, our hobby founders just didn't know anything about um, because, you know, they, they weren't found yet. They weren't known, uh, such as this set right here. But um, it, it's going to take uh, maybe maybe two generations or so for us to get a, a complete picture of what is out there. And maybe not. Maybe there are just cards out there that – were issued at one time and either destroyed or lost or whatever and you know if, if there are cards that were printed 150 to 130 years ago that we're just finding out now what else is is out there uh, honestly and how long is it going to take us to, to find this information um you know for every generation uh they always seem to come to different conclusions than the previous generation. They always seem to find out uh, new things on their own because the previous generation hasn't told them. And so uh, I kind of want to avoid that uh, with my writing. There's only so much I can do. Um, I'm only one person out there. And, um, uh, you know, again, I, I find this really fascinating. I find it fun and I find it educational as well. And it's one of the big reasons why I collect vintage cards and not just for the card but more for my own knowledge for my own education and hopefully I can uh, pass that knowledge on to other people um, I, I'm kind of posting this uh, to, to let you guys know that if you do come across some of these cards uh, you, you might want to think about purchasing a card if it's a, if it's in your price range but uh, just knowing that the backs, are, they're gonna have back damage or some kind of damage just by the way they were found. Um, I don't know how many other cards are out there. Uh, we'll, we'll probably never quite know. We do know that, that each, for every back, there should be 200 
cards, at least one sheet, because I did come in uh, one sheet. And then uh, some some uh, advertisers, I think like Furniture Brewing, um, they're only known through a sheet, and that's it. And then so you have maybe uh, two or three advertisers and that uh, are only in sheet form, and then maybe two or three copies of that. Uh, and, and some of these are really kind of found by accident. And, you know, it kind of makes me think about the set in general is that um, we don't know how many uh, advertisers are actually out there or uh, actually sent in, um, I, I guess, to uh, Felix Mendelssohn Publishing. And um, Felix Mendelssohn, I, I, I have written about him. I haven't found a photo of him yet. It's, it's very difficult to find photos of some of the uh, um, the owners of these companies um, my, my article is not done yet and uh, it's 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 uh, time expansive it's it's very difficult to find some of the, the documentation uh, for this stuff and and uh, I go kind of slow on this stuff I always try to you know dot my eyes and cross my T's when it comes to documentation uh, of this sort but it's a fascinating set the, the entire m101 series uh, including the sporting news which is uh, i think the majority of the m101 series is sporting news uh, in, in any event guys uh, i really appreciate you guys stopping by and listening to what i have to say and i really want to have a, a nice dialogue going on um on this particular back and this advertiser and, and the set um, and, and what your favorite card is, uh, your player or your advertiser and why. Uh, I'm always really interested to hear what you guys have to say. So uh, until the next time, I will talk to you later. And let me show you a photo of that uh, particular back at the National. All right, guys, thank you very much. Have a good one.